it was in 1170 that Dominic of Guzman was born in Castile. He was educated by his uncle who was the archpriest of the area and he was a good and holy child orientated from the beginning towards prayer. He gave himself therefore spontaneously to the Lord and was formed in the Augustinian family of canons regular at Osma. For the first seven years he functioned quietly with great devotion as a priest but then Providence brought him to an unexpected encounter on the way, it would seem, to Denmark. He stopped in the south of France as he encountered this threat, the Cathars, the Catharoi, the pure, the Albigensian heresy. And he saw that this had to be dealt with because of the subtle influence of apparent fervour this purity of life which they were trying to follow and which was then leading true Catholics away. They were being coaxed by this apparent fervour. And so initially he brought together a group of holy women and at Pruy in the south of France there in the Toulouse area he brought them into a convent and they were to be a visible counterpart, fervour, especially in women, which would be a beacon of light, indicating the Catholic Church also has it, and more. And then the brethren, they gathered around him, and they lived a life which was more free than the classic monastic life, but which had elements of it. The nascent Dominican order, the order of preachers, was going to be something which would have the best of both worlds. The chant was maintained, but made somewhat simpler than that of the full monastic life, which gave them time. Manual work was not going to be a part of it. That would also give them more time to study. But they were going to concentrate on prayer and the word. Actually, that's very apostolic. It's what we find in the Acts of the Apostles. The Apostles were to be free for prayer and the word. Well, this is the Dominican life. And it was going to be anchored in contemplation, of which Dominic himself was the model par excellence. It is reported that he spoke rarely, and if he did, it was only to God or of God. That's a good motto. And so, it was to be a great gift for the Church. It was given pontifical approval, but St. Dominic was not allowed to have a new rule. The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 had declared that any new orders being born had to take on the existing rules, and there were four. St. Augustine, St. Benedict, who actually uses the name of St. Augustine, St. Albert, Patriarch of Jerusalem, who gave the Carmelites their rule, and St. Francis, he is the last to have one, a new one. The others had to base them on existing rules, and the one that became very popular was the rule of St. Augustine, which is the one that he adopted, which is understandable given his early life. He had been formed under that rule early on. But he was able to put down clear detailed constitutions. He was more organised than St. Francis of Assisi, whom actually he knew and respected. 
this module was going to be also one that would attract great souls. Thomas Aquinas was actually formed in the Benedictine world of Monte Cassino as a young man, a student. But he was attracted by this evangelical model. And so we have great lights like this one coming in. Albert the Great, before him, a great brain, a Dominican. And like Dominic himself, Thomas Aquinas refused to become a bishop. These then knew the importance of being in community and being free to study and to preach. A great Franciscan, a true disciple of St. Francis, Bernardino of Siena, one of the greatest preachers of all time, also refused, refused bishoprics because he wanted to be free to preach. Interesting. Now, with regard to what is taking place here, it is breaking the mould of what had been in place massively until this great new movement of mendicant friars, enclosure and the monastic structure. There is one bridge order, that is the primos detentions, which already, although maintaining the structure of abbot, prior enclosure while in the monastery, and stability of place until death, did open up to ministry. But these new ones went further. There was no vow of stability to one place until death, so that the vow of obedience would make it possible for them to go from one convent to the other. And the world was their enclosure in that sense. Very evangelical actually. It's very similar to what the Apostles were living under the Lord himself and in the early centuries. Now, the mode of living is analysed by St Thomas Aquinas very well, of course. All that he does is well done, very accurate, very precise. And he looks into various categories of life and indicates that the life specifically of contemplation made available is supremely holy. He puts it like this, as it is superior for a lamp not just to burn and give light on its own, so it is superior for the soul to burn and give light not only for the Lord but also for men. And he resumes it in one great formula, contemplari et contemplata aliis tradere to contemplate and the contemplated things to hand on to others. It is true that it is difficult, given the fragility of human nature, to do both well. Why? The one sector encroaches on the other. Prayer becomes coinquinated by some kind of mental agitation. One is not simply contemplating, but in one's contemplation also thinking what one can say from this contemplation to others. One is concerned about also practical needs, how it can be done. And also, the tendency can be, given human nature, 
to go towards precisely that other part and become very active and to go into the disease of activism. But Benedict warned against that for the clergy. It leads to hardness of heart. Recently, Cardinal Angelo Comastri came out with a very interesting testimony. It was that he was ordained immediately after the council and he was a young priest and came across Mother Teresa in 1968. And she asked him, how much do you pray? And he said, well, I'm always faithful to the breviary. And he explained that in 1968 it was still the full breviary. And also to the daily rosary, as well as Holy Mass every day. But she went on, could you not put some personal orazione, mental prayer, in there? And she went on again, senza questo non reggerai, without that you will not resist. Now that's the bit that in the Dominican family one can easily get because the structure makes it possible. They have inbuilt every day strong moments of mental prayer as well as liturgy, well executed. And so it's a huge bulwark against activism, balance. And I remember years ago at St. Antimo where we also had the Rosa and Augustine and we had the two elements in our life, one day warning the brethren that we were losing the balance. We were taking on huge parish work and also huge guest work and we were becoming too thinly spread. Alas, it's actually what was taking place and what actually happened and it didn't work. When that takes place, interior life suffers and souls become much more a prey to other energies and vocations can be lost. So the demon can actually tempt priests by good things, doing many, many, many things for souls, but neglecting their own. And then what happens? Unexpectedly, something throws them away. And because they've not had those long, quiet moments of gazing and loving, they can't see exactly the depth of what's happening in a short time. The soul which is distracted and absent from intimacy of contemplation is much more easy to hit. So, this strong formula of balance, complete equilibrium, is one that we need, all of us. Otherwise, what are we? Fidgets. I came across this morning something which nearly made me cry. It was what happened in the moment just after ordination when I was told to go back to Rome by the prior to find a place there and also the right college. And to finish what had been begun, that is to go to the doctorate. And I remember having first looked at the Augustinianum, the place where it was possible to do a lot of work on St. Augustine. I went back eventually to my own university, which was the Angelicum, precisely the one that bears the name of the Angelic Doctors, St. Thomas Aquinas, which is run by the Dominicans, where as it happens, 
John Paul II had been before, and he actually came back to us one day to give us a lecture. And getting back there, and knowing it, that's when I had to do it, back in the alma mater at the old university, it was very, very moving, because one actually smells the past coming back. There's a smell in the building, and the grace in the building links all the prayer done before it comes back. That university is the only one in Rome, actually, which has perpetual adoration going on all day during term time. A lot of prayer goes on there. We all wore our habit. The liturgy was well executed, and it was orthodox in teaching. So I remember when I got back to the alma mater, it was the 16th of December 1997, a few weeks therefore after ordination, I sat and wrote these words, breathing in the grace of truth absorbed in silence. Alma Mater, sweet mother, this place I have known well, this place I know, and love for what it was and what it knew when knowledge was new found. For here we grow again, where many greener heads once grew. O oh, thought, we thought, old feeling felt again. Upon these well-trod steps, these arched ways to angles of spent hours, to sweetest pain of learning dense, condensed in measured days. I thought not thee to see Alma on earth again, ere I went on to learning's home. And though tis late, a little, little mirth I shall allow to tingle and to come into a breast that rested not too well and meddled with a molecule of hell.